I mean, we're all familiar with what windmills look like. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly know what most of the oil equipment looks like. What are some of the technologies being tried to capture the energy from both wave and tidal? That's a, a very interesting question because at this stage of the development of the sector, uh, there is not yet convergence of device concept. The, the most developed uh, systems are possibly oscillating water columns, which are uh, uh, a chamber which is placed over the surface of the water and the, the waves rise within the chamber and force air out through a, a turbine. Uh, other devices uh, include uh, devices like Palamis, which is, is like, a, it's like a sea snake mm. in which the waves form oscillations in the, the, the structure of the sea snake and they, they can generate uh, substantial quantities of electricity in deep water environments. There's another concept which is, is basically using the, uh, um, the, the motion of uh, a buoy or a buoy, I believe you call them in this part of the world, <laughs> in which the, the, the buoy responds to the waves and you use that motion to drive a, a power extraction system. Mm. There's a, another category of device we call an overtopper, in which we use a, a, a shaped structure to force the water in a wave to run uphill slightly, and mm. then we let it fall back down to sea level through a turbine. Um, there's many other devices, but I think these are really the, the most significant wave power devices. Well, we mentioned a three gigawatt target. Um, how much power do these devices generate? At the moment, the consensus is that individual devices will probably be rated approximately one megawatt, uh, okay. which is somewhat smaller than the biggest wind turbines. Uh, we believe that commercial development will be in farms of these devices, many devices all in a, a close location. How do these technologies um, become commercial? Uh, part of that process is going to be testing in the field. Right. Uh, going in the water, demonstrating the devices work to give the investor confidence that they're investing in something that uh, has a, a, a potential to deliver. Even the most uh, uh, adventurous investor is not going to invest in something that uh, you know, really has got very little uh, in the way of data or experience behind it. Within the UK, we've established um, what's known as the European Marine Energy Centre, which is based in the islands of Orkney, mm -hmm. off the north coast of the Scottish mainland. So we have four wave sites and we have five tidal sites. And uh, these are monitored from a single location on the west coast of uh, the island of Orkney. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a single monitoring uh, base uh, so that we can uh, follow the behaviour of these devices, be they wave or, or tidal. And uh, ultimately, at the end of a, a rigorous test program, the developer will get a, a certificate mm -hmm. which uh, details uh, the performance and the behavior of the device. It's, uh, it is literally the, the equivalent of type testing. I'll say this device worked for two years. It produced uh, electricity of a particular quality. There mm. was a particular record of maintenance. It's a, a very close monitoring program that uh, the European Centre uh, would, uh, would implement. Are there currently any devices being tested at the facility? There's uh, one wave power device has been tested. It's been through a test program. That's Palamis. Mm -hmm. which, uh, that's the sea snake. That's the sea snake. Yeah. That's correct. And uh, the company that uh, built that device and tested the device at EMEC uh, have currently built uh, an additional four devices uh, which will be installed uh, off the coast of Portugal okay. in uh, you know, really the first world's first wave farm. Mm. Uh, in, uh, in the year ahead. Those devices are down there basically in the, the pre-installation phase. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a tidal device which is undergoing tests at the moment built by a company called Open Hydro mm. and uh, that is uh, generating electricity now and that electricity is going into the grid and the device is being monitored continually. We're expecting a second wave power device to be installed later this year, a mm -hmm. device called uh, uh, Oyster and uh, the the five tidal berths are all fully booked. So there is now a queue of developers to go into the tidal site and uh, we will start seeing additional tidal devices uh, towards the end of this year. Coming back to our three gigawatt target, uh, what are some of the barriers that this industry is facing? Mm, of course, the biggest barrier at the moment is financial. You know, we're in a pre-commercial phase, mm -hmm. so actually achieving investment is uh, probably the, the biggest barrier. However, uh, th there are issues, technical issues, that uh, we have to overcome. In general, I, I, the, the biggest technical issues are all to do with installation. 
Mm. It's a difficult environment to, to work in and a very large proportion of the cost of a marine renewable project as related to this installation. The fixing of the devices uh, in place, either fixed to the seabed or through mooring systems, and um, also, of course, being able to uh, gain access to devices for maintenance. I, I think mm -hmm. this is where the real technical challenges are. And of course, technical challenge means cost. Yes. What about environmental? Environmental impact, of course, of any energy uh, source is, is crucial. There is no such thing as an energy source which does no environmental uh, change. Mm -hmm. I prefer the term environmental change rather than environmental damage, of <laughs> course, because a change can be positive as well as negative. Uh, wave power devices, uh, the current thinking is that most wave power systems will be environmentally fairly benign. Uh, there are possibilities of, of change in sedimentation patterns, mm. and, and these are things which will need to be monitored. With tidal power, um, there are possible issues about uh, modifying the, uh, the tidal flows. Uh, which may change the movement of nutrient. Mm -hmm. uh, other concerns have been raised about the possible impact of marine life with tidal devices. Uh, I believe that these are design issues. I believe that uh, we can design the technology so that these impact issues are not relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a case of careful blade design, careful support systems, and of course, uh, being sensitive to the uh, locations in which we install them, I think it's uh, I think it's a it's one for the device designers and the project designers. Interesting. Uh, every time we've entered into a new area of uh, generating power, there are always a lot of costs to get things started. Of course. How is the UK funding this this adventure into wave and tidal power? We have a, a complex series of uh, funding uh, uh, techniques or funding principles. Uh, the UK government have announced something called the Marine Renewable Deployment Fund. It's a uh, £50 million uh, set aside to help develop the early stages mm -hmm. of the, the wave and tidal industry. Of that uh, £50 million, £42 million is specifically for developers um, who have a technology. It's not there to help them build the devices. It's mm -hmm. there if they've got a device that has been proven to work in the field uh, in order to help them through the very difficult stage between device development and true commercial development. So it's a, uh, it, it's a bridging fund, mm -hmm. if you like. But that's not the only mechanism that we have. We have the Renewable Obligation Certificate Scheme, ROCS, mm -hmm. as they're known, which is um, a parallel currency in which renewable energy can be paid for. So if you sell electricity from a renewable device to uh, uh, into the distribution grid to the company that distributes the electricity, mm -hmm. as well as getting money for the electricity, you will receive what are known as ROCs, the certificates, which says that you have delivered energy. These ROCs themselves have a cash value, mm. and uh, they can be uh, redeemed for cash, in effect. They can be sold, they can be traded, just like a currency. So no one's been able to access this fund currently? No, the, the Marine Renewable Deployment Fund has a threshold, a capability threshold. Mm -hmm. And uh, this means that uh, you've got to be able to demonstrate your technology. Your technology has had to actually have worked already at okay. full scale. Okay. So you, you have to be able to convince the, the government department that this is real. Mm -hmm. that uh, you've already operated it, you've generated electricity, you've produced data, verifiable data that can, uh, can be used to say, yes, this device is working. It's not a development fund. Okay. It's to support the very, very early stages of commercial development, really through the pre-commercial phase, mm -hmm. between research, between development, and actually into the, where you can go into the truly open market. So how do you get the word out? That's part of what I'm doing now. Of course. Um, oil and gas industry will become more interested as it becomes more obvious that this has an economic potential. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, early success of uh, the, 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 the first round of projects will be the most significant way of getting the word out. Mm -hmm. And already there are uh, companies that are uh, more used to working in the oil and gas industry who are already applying their skills in uh, the marine renewable sector. 